Well, this morning I'm excited to introduce, introduce you to a brand new series. Having spent 35 weeks in the book of Hebrews, for the summer, we're going to have what I'll call a little summer series, a little something different, going to change, um, going to change things up a little bit. This will be a topical series, and it's one that intends to equip us as the church to be the church in the way that I mentioned earlier. And it's going to be one that I hope will spur us on as agents of redemption in our neighborhoods, in our communities, at work, wherever we are in God's world. So that's the big idea, a topical series. And this series, really, to, to introduce it, this series was birthed in the years past of adulthood and middle age for me as a homeowner and as a parent who began to see and experience in day-to-day -day life how everything is broken. So there was a particular season some, I don't know, five, seven years ago where I had one of those days, and you've had these days, you've had these weeks, you've had these months, you've had these years, where you've got a few hours to get something done, and you go and get on the lawnmower, and it won't start. And so you say, okay, I'll do something else. And so you go to fix something that's broken, and you use a tool, and the tool breaks. And you live 25 minutes from Lowe's, and it's too much time to commit to go and get a new tool. And so you transition yet again and you decide you're going to do the third thing. And you go to your car and your car won't start or you have a flat tire. I had a season like this years ago. And I actually had a season like this in the past year. You fill in the blank, whether it's bathrooms or septic tanks or leaking roofs or whatever it is. Sometimes it, it's just apparent that the clock is ticking on everything that's made out of plastic, wood, metal, you fill in the blank. Or even your own body, your own diagnosis, your own disease, whatever it is. Everything is broken. Everything is broken. So this morning, an introduction to a Christian worldview, one that, if you don't listen carefully, you could think is a message of despair. Everything's broken. But as Christians with a Christian worldview, we're honest that everything is broken, but we have a robust view of what God is doing in Jesus to redeem all that is His. Amen? So there's your big picture. And to prepare us for the concept, our passage that we'll read is from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 4. Isaiah the prophet speaking the words of the Lord and I think these will resonate with what you've heard so far. Isaiah says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Let's pray that the Lord would bless our understanding of His Word. Lord, Your Word is holy. It is true. And by faith we trust it. We look to it. 
to shape us, to direct us, to instruct us and inform us. So Lord, would you use this morning these few words from the prophet of Isaiah and elsewhere to kindle in all of our hearts, whether young or old, an honest view of the world in which we live and a robust view of your redemption and what you are doing through your church. We pray it together in Jesus' name. Amen. So a second story of how this series has been birthed. As a child who grew up in the country and on a farm in White Oak, South Carolina, Fairfield County, for those who know the area, my dad was retired from the Air Force and he moved home to take over his dad's cattle ranch. And so from grades 1 to 12, I lived in White Oak, South Carolina. And I have memories as a young child up to high school of getting in my dad's truck in the evening. And we would drive around the pastures and he would, he would point things out. He would say, look over here, that, that fence needs repair. And I would be like, what fence? I, okay, that fence. And then he'd see a, a tree that had fallen that was in the way and needed to, to be cut up, cleaned up, and removed. And then he'd drive around the house, around the home property, and just start pointing at things. Things that he said, son, you need to have eyes to see these things. Because as a child, I didn't have eyes to see these things, right? I was thinking about what was on TV and what was for dinner. Fast forward decades to where I am now a homeowner and a property owner with children. And my children and my wife will tell you it is not uncommon for me to put somebody on the golf cart and to drive around the property and to start pointing at things. There's a broken fence. There's a fallen tree, both of which we have in our yard right now. And, and for me to say, do you see what I'm talking about? And maybe for them to be like, hmm, what? No, I don't have eyes to see it. They're not the homeowner. You know how this is. You remember as a child that you didn't have the eyes to see what adults saw. So there's some definition of terms that will help you understand how my mind is working on this subject. And the two terms or phrases that I'm going to use that you'll hear me reference or that you'll see in the sermon. The first is fixing broken things. Hashtag FBT. And the second is making things better. Hashtag MTB. Um, anybody who's on social media, you'll see that I'll tag those things from time to time, and it's when summertime comes and it's project time. Having eyes to see what needs to be done. Where have my eyes gotten used to the way things are and are no longer thinking about how things can be or how things should be? So fixing broken things, making things better. That's the theme of redemption through which I hope to communicate, encourage, and inspire us all to look at the world in which we live and to look at ourselves through the lens of redemption and what can be by the power of the gospel. So this morning is an introduction to a biblical worldview, a Christian worldview. And these are the pieces that need to be in place for the coming weeks to make proper sense according to Scripture. So three simple points this morning, and this is an introduction to how Christians are to think about ourselves, about one another, and about the world in which we live. And the first point is this. It's the wonder of creation. The Scriptures tell us, as you know, in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, the story of how God created the earth why God created the earth. The Scriptures are clear that God created all things, that He made them out of nothing, that He did so in six days, and it says that it was all good. He made all things good. The biblical word, the Hebrew word for the condition of that garden in chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis is that they were at peace 
with God. Shalom. So the garden in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 was a place free of sin, a place of shalom, where lawnmowers didn't break down and, and golf carts worked and chainsaws could start. There was peace in creation. Cornelius Plantiga, who's a theologian from Calvin College and Calvin Seminary, in his book, his description of sin, talks about the garden in Genesis 1 and 2 in this way. He says, in the Bible, shalom means universal flourishing, wholeness, and delight. A rich state of affairs in which natural needs are satisfied and natural gifts fruitfully employed. A state of affairs that inspires joyful wonder as its creator and savior opens doors and welcomes the creatures in whom he delights. Shalom, in other words, is the way things ought to be. That's the story of Genesis 1 and 2. A story of peace, a story of shalom, a story of a garden in good order. But you know that Genesis chapter 3 follows Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And here's where the story of the world would change. And that is the tragedy of the fall. The ruin of sin and what it's done to creation, to everything in creation, and to everyone in creation. All of creation is now fallen. The biblical language for being ruined, distorted, and perverted. Creation as you and I know it is now in chaos. It's in confusion. It's in conflict. Plantiga, that same theologian, says this. The story of the fall tells us that sin corrupts. It puts asunder what God had joined together and joins together what God had put asunder. Like some devastating twister, sinful corruption both explodes and implodes creation, pushing towards the formless void from which it came. And I think that's a marvelous way to capture what happened in the fall. Everything's in chaos. Everything is ruined. Everything is perverted as we know it. Everything and everyone really has been corrupted by sin. Now remember, this is an introduction to a biblical worldview. If we're going to think in the language and the categories that the Bible gives us as the church, we've got to have a clear doctrine of creation, Genesis 1 and 2, and an honest view of the fall, Genesis chapter 3 on, because it gives us the lens to view everything and everyone in God's world. Sin has broken everything and everyone. So in 1989, Bob Dylan wrote a song called Everything is Broken. It's not a Christian song but it captures well the reality of the world in which we live. Listen to some of these lyrics. Broken lines, broken strings, broken threads, broken springs, broken idols, broken heads, people sleeping in broken beds. Ain't no use jiving, ain't no use joking. Everything is broken. Broken bottles, broken plates, broken switches, Broken gates, broken dishes, broken parts. Streets are filled with broken hearts. Broken words never meant to be spoken. Everything is broken. Seems like every time you stop and turn around, something else just hits the ground. Broken cutters, broken saws, broken buckles, broken laws. Broken bodies, broken bones, broken voices, broken phones. Take a deep breath. It feels like I'm choking because everything is broken. 
Every time you leave and go off someplace, things fall to pieces in my face. Broken hands, broken plows, broken treaties, broken vows, broken pipes, broken tools, people bending broken rules. It's all broke down. Everything I see is broken. Everything is broken. Well, that sounds like a lot of despair, doesn't it? But does it not resonate with your experience in this life? Everything's broken. That event of Genesis chapter 3, the fall, it's true. It's real. And we shouldn't be surprised when we bump up into it in everyday life. The reality of the fall, it's, it's seen all around us. And it could be a message of despair if it ended there, but it doesn't. There's a third point to our sermon this morning. We've heard of the wonder of creation, the tragedy of the fall, but the third point is the best of all, and that is the beauty of redemption. The beauty of redemption. Three passages here for us to consider. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, right after the ruin of the fall, in the early part of chapter 3, we're given this beautiful promise that God says He will provide a Redeemer. He will provide someone to crush the head of the serpent or to break the teeth of the serpent as we sang in our song or heard sung in our song just a minute ago. God makes this beautiful promise that He is going to do something about that ruin of sin in the earth. And in Isaiah chapter 61, which was our primary Scripture reading for the sermon, We heard beautiful poetry about that Redeemer, about what God would do to bind up the brokenhearted, to send redemption to the ruins of the cities of the earth, that God, in fact, would do something. And here's just a beautiful gospel nugget for you to take from this. That passage from Isaiah 61, in Luke chapter 4, We read this. Jesus has returned to Nazareth, to His hometown, has gone to the synagogue for worship. And as a visitor, He has handed a scroll to read. He didn't choose the scroll. It was handed to Him. But perhaps He chose the particular passage that He would read. And it says this in Luke chapter 4. Jesus went to Nazareth where He had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Luke says, He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And that was the position of the teacher in that day, a seated position. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Which is this. It's Jesus taking that beautiful promise of Isaiah 61, and he's applying it to himself. He is saying, redemption has come to the earth in me, and you are now looking at the Redeemer. It's a beautiful promise of Isaiah. It's a beautiful fulfillment by Jesus. It's the beauty of redemption. In Isaiah 61, we're given a beautiful poetic description of the promise of restoration. The promise of renewal. Even of reversal of the curse of sin. The promise of healing for the brokenhearted of freedom for captives from sin, 
and comfort for all those who are in the misery of sin. And Jesus ascribes all of that to Himself. That in Him, we have all of those things. And so we have a hope of great redemption because we have faith in a great Redeemer who has come. In the midst of our misery, the tragedy of sin, He has come and He has declared Himself to be the Redeemer. Now, Nehemiah chapter 1 was our reflection this morning. I don't think it was on the wall. It is in your bulletin. But let me read that as we transition into the close in the considering of this redemption we have in Jesus. In Nehemiah chapter 1, it's recorded, it was reported to me, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down. And its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. Here you have Nehemiah, the instrument of God. And that promise made in Genesis chapter 3 that the Lord would send a Redeemer to undo the curse on the earth. The promise later made to Abraham that God would call a people to Himself and bless them and their children to make them to be His church. So much history has led up to this moment. And at this point in Nehemiah's recording of history, it seems as though all hope is lost. Jerusalem and the walls around the city have collapsed and crumbled and are in decay. The city is vulnerable. The city is no more. And Nehemiah hears of this, and he's burdened. He's burdened by the brokenness of God's people, by the ruin and the decay, where it seems as though God's promises are not going to come true. But if you know the rest of the story of Nehemiah, you know that God is at work in him and through him. And those walls would be rebuilt by him And by God's people, even when there's great opposition and resistance, even when there's dirty political play, even when there's broken promises, corruption, God's city will be rebuilt. And in Nehemiah, we see at least two things that I want to apply to us as a church. Number one, he's burdened. His heart is broken. The condition of God's people the condition of the earth, he's burdened in his soul, in his heart. And I wonder sometimes if we share any sense of burden for the ruin in our own lives and in everything around us. Or have we grown apathetic to it? It's just the way that it is. Nehemiah models a burden that inspires him to do something redemptive as God has called him to in Christ Jesus. The second thing we see is not just that burden, but that willingness to do something. The willingness to do hard things. And Nehemiah would do some very hard things, putting his own life at risk for the sake of restoring the ruins, for the sake of making things as they ought to be, as he was called to do, by God Himself. And so, this morning, I want to remind us that the Gospel and God's promise to renew and to restore and to rebuild, that promise carries on. That as one songwriter has written, the Lord really can take broken things and broken people and make them beautiful again. Does your view of the gospel have that front and center in your mind? That God is at work fulfilling His promises, renewing, restoring broken people and broken things? Or have you reached the point in your life and faith that maybe cold play better sums up the way that you are thinking? Cursed, missed opportunities. Am I a part of the cure Or am I part of the disease? For those of you who know that song. 
It's a great question to ask. Consider the, the cursed and wasted opportunities that are all around you. And it will cause you to begin to wonder. If you see apathy in your own heart and in your own living of the Christian life, every one of us ought to have moments where we say, now wait a minute, stop. Am I being a part of the cure of redemption? Or am I part of the problem? Part of the disease and the ruin and the decay of the things that I'm involved in? God is calling us to have a robust view of redemption. Not a belief in ourselves to fix things, but a belief in His promises. That He is a Redeemer and through His church, He is doing things. And I'll close with that. Two things about what He's doing. Number one, God is committed to fixing that which is His, that which is his and addressing the broken things out there there. Those things that are out there. And there are examples of the church doing this in history that are great examples. Christian hospitals, Christian care centers, whether for pregnancy or drug addiction, gambling addiction, those agents that show mercy to the miseries and the fears of this life. God uses His church, He uses His Christian, his, his people to address those things in the world out there. And we as a church try to support those things financially and with the labor of our own hands, whatever we can do. We believe we have a robust view of redemption that God would not leave the world to crumble apart from His church showing mercy and grace. Did you know that as of 2016... 18.5% of hospitals were religiously affiliated. That's 726 hospitals. That's an example of what I'm talking about where the church says, we'll address the physical needs of sin in this life. And healthcare is one way in which we can do that. So having a heart and an eye for what God is doing in the world and being willing to support and encourage it as we believe in the redemption of all that belongs to Christ Jesus. But fixing broken things out there is just one part of it. What we're going to consider in the weeks ahead is not just that, but probably more so God's commitment to redeem, to fix the broken things in here. The broken things in here. That God is not leaving us to remain as we are, but He is doing a work of redemption in us and through us to transform us. That's all biblical world and life view. That you would care about what's going on out there, that you would have concern for what's going on in here, inside of your own heart and in the hearts of one another. So what is your view of redemption? Has it been robust? Or has it been apathetic? We should have a robust view of God redeeming all things. Of God making all things better in Christ Jesus. That's a robust view of redemption. And Plantinga, I'll quote one more time, sums it up well this way. He says, the point of our lives... It's not to get smart. It's not to get rich or even to get happy. The point is to discover God's purposes for us and to make them our own. To be a Christian is to participate in this very common human enterprise of diagnosis, prescription, and prognosis but to do so from inside a Christian view of the world. A view that has been constructed from Scripture and that centers on Jesus Christ the Savior. Offering Christian hope, which centers on Jesus Christ, the Lord of the whole cosmos, the One through whom God was pleased to reconcile to Himself all things. That's a robust view of redemption. That pushes against the apathy in my heart and perhaps in yours. So by God's grace, 
by God's grace through these summer months of considering this subject. Let's pray that the Lord would stir in us a heart that sees that this world is our Father's world and that He has compassion on those who belong to Him. He is committed to fixing broken things. He is committed to making things better. And one day, ultimately, He will. And it's not in this life. It's in the next. But He's called us to tarry on and to tarry well, being like Him, being agents of redemption in His world. Let's pray that that would be true. Our Father in heaven, would you work in us a robust view of your redemption in Christ Jesus, a heart for the world, a heart for our neighbors, a heart for the workplace, a heart for culture, a heart for transformation, that we would see that this is your world and we should never forget that though the wrong seems off so strong. You are the ruler yet. Lord, do this in us and through us that we might be the church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.